and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Well, we're living in some very interesting times, moments of great reflection. We've covered some of those issues. We're going to cover many more in the weeks and months ahead. But today was such a great opportunity to speak to what I believe is one of the world's top science writers. His name is Julian Cripp. And Julian has written many books and inspired many people. And we're going to be talking about many of those issues today. I'm not going to spoil it for you, um, other than to say I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Julian Crew. Welcome to the show, Julian. Thank you, Rob. Julian, uh, you are a prolific writer, uh, and I've read so many of your books, and I wanted to discuss those with you today. Uh, but I wondered if you might just share with our listener a little bit about your story and how what got you to this point. Yeah, well, uh, I, as you say, I've been a, a journalist and a newspaper editor for nigh on 50 years now. Um, I've been writing about science for nearly all of that time, uh, but I've been a specialist science writer really since the mid-1990s. Um, and I wrote about science because it was journalistic freedom to me. You can write about anything you like. Um, and as I progressed in my science writing, I began bumping into more and more scientists and grandparents such as myself um, and uh, young millennials who were all rather despairing and saying, is this the end of uh, history as we know it? Um, and, and that concerned me deeply. Um, what I knew was that we were in some considerable trouble, but I didn't know how bad that trouble was. But I thought, as a science writer, it's possible for me to delve into the best science in the world and find out exactly what is going on. What does the best science say about the many and various risks that humanity is manufacturing for itself? And that's basically where it went. I started off looking at the food risks because that's the area that I knew best. Um, but I pretty soon branched out into all the other risks as well. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've written four books and, uh, well, many thousands of articles since that time. Yeah, well, I became very aware of your work with The Poison Planet, which was published in 2014. And I know you're going through a revision of it, as only one can, given the scale of the problem. Can you tell us a bit about that book and, and some of the learnings that, you know, you shared with your reader there? Yeah, that, that grew out of uh, work that I did for a, um, a cooperative research centre called the Cooperative Research Centre for Contamination Assessment and Remediation of the Environment, CRC Care, and with Professor Ravi Naidu in particular, who headed that up. And, and they were looking at the issue of contaminated sites and how do you clean them up? Um, but they started broadening that out into more and more different aspects of contamination. Um, and I found this absolutely fascinating. And the more I delved into it, they used to hold these big conferences where scientists from all over the world would, would attend um, with their own stories of, of local pollution. And I began to see this big jigsaw puzzle assembling before my very eyes. Every single one of these stories was a story of local pollution. So it might be air pollution in Beijing or water pollution in Shanghai or water pollution in the United States. But it started to add up to me to a very big picture. And that's the advantage of being a science writer. Unlike a scientist, you're not confined by a single area of discipline. You know, you can, you can look at the big picture. You can assemble all of the pieces uh, and, and see what sort of a picture you get. And I started to get very, very concerned at the enormous scale of the pollution of the planet that was taking place. Um, and uh, I started to rough out some numbers on the back of an envelope, and it quickly um, struck me that, that the pollution of the planet that we're doing, by all the various means that we have, actual production of toxic chemicals, but also the unintentional release of soil and polluted water and things like that, it's many times larger. Our impact on the planet is many times larger uh, than the, the uh, impact of climate change, in fact. Mm. Sorry, I've got to pause there. My telephone's ringing. <laughs> That's all right. Um, the interesting thing about the chemical side of things is that it's not only the chemicals that are produced as an end product, but there's so many others that are given off as waste along the way as well. So many more chemicals than we even imagine we're, we're being exposed to, we're exposed to. 
Yes, and, and I have to say that the chemistry, the chemical industry has been very disingenuous about this, you know, and, and they've, they've run this, they've relied, I find this extraordinary, they've relied on this old chap called Paracelsus, who was around 500 years ago, a Swiss alchemist of all people, who, who said the dose is the poison. So whenever you ask a, a chemical company, is their product poisonous? They say, oh, no, as long as you, it's less than so many parts per billion. In your, in your glass of water or your pizza or whatever it is, it, it's harmless. And that, of course, is complete and utter bullshit. Um, you know, that, that really, that chemical can combine, uh, it can mount up in your system, it can bioaccumulate, um, it, it, it can uh, produce new chemicals, it can produce daughter products. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can happen there. So by, by saying to society don't worry about it chemicals are safe we've been using them for years um these guys are just they're they're fudging it to put it politely and and they're uh, they're lying flat out to to, to put it more directly mm. um, and the medical science which is really piling up now and there are tens if not hundreds of thousands of medical papers now that are making the connection between various chemicals or mixtures of chemicals and various human diseases and we had the Lancet Commission come out two years ago and estimate that 9 million people, 9 million people were dying of, uh, of chemical poisoning of one sort or another, or diseases started by it, every single year. So that's 50% higher than the death toll in World War II. You know, so this is a really serious, this is a really serious issue. And even that is a very large underestimate because, for example, it doesn't include cancers. And we know that anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of all cancers are triggered by uh, some kind of chemical in your environment, acting on your genes, uh, you know, scrambling your, your, your cells, uh, your immune system in some way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the picture is probably much, much worse than 9 million. It, it's probably of the order of 14, 15 million. Uh, and and we don't know. The, the answer is most of the chemicals that we produce, there's 140,000 of them, have never been tested for human safety. Um, or they've, they've only been tested in a very vestigial manner. For example, the, the, the uh, maximum residue limits are, are set on the basis of, a, of an adult male. That doesn't tell you whether children are getting poisoned mm -hmm. by the same chemical at those supposedly safe rates or whether women or people of lower body mass are getting poisoned. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of misleading information going on about this. And I felt that it was my job to try to bring together all the science I could find on this topic, but put it in, in, in a way that ordinary consumers uh, can understand and use in their daily lives as they try to avoid these things. Hmm. Well, it is ultimately we as consumers that drive the market for those chemicals and uh, you know, by making informed choices. And, and this is a story that's very easy to miss, but once you hear it, very difficult to ignore. You came out of that book. I know that at the end of that book, you had various, um, you know, there were principles that we should adopt. Could you just share a couple of those with us? Yeah, well, um, I feel that there ought to be a human right not to be poisoned. And we've got a human right not to be tortured. You know, and, and uh, we've got a human right, you know, to, to a, a, a healthy life. We've got a human right to, you know, democratic expression of our views. There's all kinds of human rights. But this poisoning has really only been going in the last 50 to 70 years. You know, it, it really got to go on with World War II and the rise of the, the big chemical industries, which were making munitions. Uh, you know, they made the, the, the poison gases and the shells and God knows what in World War II. <clears throat> so, so really that chemistry industry is what's doing, the, and of course, the, the massive outgrowth in the petroleum industry, because a lot of these things are made from petroleum. Uh, so it's a very recent phenomenon. The point is that every single human being prior to the Industrial Revolution did not get poisoned by man-made chemicals. You know, mm. with the exception of the ones that Lucretia Borgia took out or one or two of those. But seriously, our entire ancestry lived a, a life free of these toxins. Now we've got something like 200 billion tonnes of them. 
being emitted every single year, you know, in our air, in our food, in our water, in our clothing, in our houses, in our cars, um, you know, we've got absolutely no handle, scientifically speaking, on the quantum of this problem. So I, I thought a good place to start was to establish a human right not to be poisoned. And that's just a way of conditioning the debate around this issue. It's just a, it's drawing a line in the sand saying everyone has a right to a reasonably healthy life. A big chemical company, uh, you know, or a careless mining company cannot just come along and poison you. And the problem that we've seen so far, if you look at all of the big chemical scandals, Minamata and Bhopal and Cervezo and, you know, all of those, Tianjin and things like that, the onus of proof has always been on the victims to prove that they got poisoned, mm. not on the government or the chemical company to prove that its processes were safe. And that's an outrage, basically. People are being killed. They're being killed. You know, the, the chemical companies know they're killing people. But they, you know, they, they hide behind lawyers. They hide behind sham claims and, and you know, 15th century uh, alchemists <laughs> and what have you. So mm. this has got to change. And, and I think the push has got to come from the medical profession. The medical profession has got to front up and say, enough of these things. And they're starting to say that. Get mm. them out of our food, get them out of our air, get them out of our water. Um, and consumers have to be given the right information so that they know what they're buying. Yes. Well, it's interesting. I mean, the regulatory bodies that have largely been dismantled and in the last 40 or 50 years are not a small part of the problem. But it's interesting to consider, I think there was um, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, in 19, when he left in 1961, said the thing we have to fear most is the influence of the industrial and military, the unsolicited influence of the industrial and military complex. And this is translated into this very issue that you raise in your book, isn't it? Yes, it has. I mean, uh, the, the chemical industry is not as powerful as the coal and oil industries, although they're so closely related to one another, there's hardly any light daylight between them. Um, it is true that governments like the American government and the Australian government are pretty much in the pockets of the, of the large fossil fuels industries. Um, and, you know, a lot of the poisoning that is going on around us is the result of the activity of those, those big industries. I mean, for example... Um, we, we are moving away from coal and we're moving away from oil. And the oil industry is now so frightened that it's putting all its efforts into developing new petrochemical products that are all going to be toxic. And the classic example is plastics. The reason the world is flooded with plastics is that oil companies were no longer able to make so much profit from motor fuels. So they transferred their effort to value-added plastics. And, and other products, including pharmaceuticals. So, you know, they're just, they're just shifting the, bloody, the, the, the playing field uh, underneath our very feet to keep on polluting the world that we live in. And that's got to stop. Mm. I mean, there is a, such a thing as green chemistry, uh, which is chemistry that is harmless and that, that involves recycling of things. And, uh, you know, it's pretty innocuous. We need to be doing much more of that. So that, that's not going to happen unless consumers put the pressure on manufacturing companies and others to stop doing the bad stuff and start doing the right stuff. So, so there has to be a risk and reward process set up. You know, we're going to have to pay companies to produce sustainable, safe, healthy products. It's going to cost more money. Um, but that's got to happen if we want to stop dying of these horrible diseases. Mm. Well, it's, it's the, this idea of seemingly cheap food and products are not so seemingly are not so cheap when health and environmental costs are factored into the cost of these low cost products. It's it's uh, we need a more holistic way of accounting for it, and we're going to come to one of those in a moment. <laughs> but uh, another book, and I know you are going through a revision of this 2014 book uh, as we speak. Really, aren't you? Is that what you're working on now, Julian? Oh, yes, it is. Um, so, so I'm working on a book for Cambridge University Press, which updates all the information in that, goes to the very latest science. And since I wrote Poison Planet about six years ago, seven years ago, uh, there's been a tremendous amount of new science, particularly medical research, 
uh, come to light that makes the connection between various chemicals and various diseases. I mean, I, I think we've gone through the same phase that the world went through with tobacco um, back in the 1980s and, and 1990s and things like that, where there was huge denial on the part of the industry. There was mounting evidence, you know, on behalf of the Surgeon General and everybody else that cigarettes can kill you. But, you know, even so, it, was, it took a, a tough and bloody struggle to get the acceptance that cigarettes produce all these, what, 7,000 different chemicals, mm -hmm. <laughs> any of which can kill you. Um, so, so, you know, they're, they're bad for your health. It took a long, long time. Well, but we have to make the same argument about plastics, about uh, additives to our food. There's something like 16,500 different chemicals can get in your food. You know, the, the number has magnified in the last 30, 40 years dramatically. More chemicals used on farm, more chemicals used in food processing, um, you know, more chemicals in food packaging. You know, it, it, it's, it's a very alarming state of affairs mm. and very little monitoring going on worldwide. I mean, the, the Americans um, test the blood of, of their people and guess what they find? They find that nearly every American is a walking contaminated site. <laughs> They're absolutely mm. full of industrial chemicals and carcinogens. Yes. And, and, you know, other studies have shown this goes right the way back to uh, infancy and even into the womb. You know, babies are now being born with a, with a load of 200 industrial chemicals already in their blood. Hmm. So, you know, I mean, we, we, we're in a dire situation. But what has not happened is there has not been the focus on this issue like there has been with climate change and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. There hasn't been a worldwide focus on this. Scientists have been talking about it. Consumers have been talking about it. But there has not had anything like the profile, scientifically speaking, of, of the climate issue. Mm. Yes. Well, um, <clears throat> then another book that you wrote was called, and very prescient that title, considering what we are going through in this year of 2020, but it was Surviving the 21st Century. <laughs> I mean, there's a catchy title, if ever you wanted one for the 21st century. Tell us about that book. Well, uh, th this fed into the end of history idea um, that a lot of people were forecasting the end of history. And this book answers that question. Um, what are the risks? So basically, I, I reduced the risks to 10 major risks, but they're all interconnected. They all come out of human overpopulation and over use of resources, over exploitation of the earth. So all of them fall out of that. But they go all, they include nuclear war, you know, they, they include the, the chemical poisoning thing we've just mentioned. Um, they include uncontrolled new technologies like artificial intelligence and mass surveillance and things like that. So what I did was I took each one of those threats and I described the threat as science sees it and the debate around it scientifically. And then I listed the solutions from a, from a human species point of view. But I also put in a little box at the end saying, this is what you can do in your life to, be, to, to, to live more safely, to, to help change humanity away from this suicidal course, basically, because these things taken together will almost certainly bring down civilization if we do not fix them. And in several combinations, they could actually extinguish us as a species. Mm. And one of them, of course, was a pandemic disease. Yeah, and pandemic disease is connected with all of the others because it comes out of the fact that we're extinguishing wild animals all the way around the world. So viruses that live in bats and pangolins and God knows what have to go and live in the human compost heap because it's the biggest available you know, bunch of carbon on the planet for them to survive in. They've got no choice. There's not enough bats left. We're cutting down the rainforests where all these animals lived, and that is bringing humans into closer contact. So that's allowing the, 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 the spillover, the transmission from one species to another to take place. Normally, you don't catch foreign viruses from other animals. You know, um, it takes an awful lot of effort to actually to, to, to get a breakthrough of a virus into human beings. Um, and and you, the circumstances have to be exactly right for it to occur. But we are creating those circumstances more and more often. And of course, in our airline travel and child minding centers and things like that, we've created the perfect crucible for viruses to travel and be shared around the world. 
I mean, viruses are not very smart. You know, they're, they're, they're just looking for a good feed or <laughs> somewhere nice to breed. Um, we provide them with, with lots of cells that are very suitable for them to reproduce in. That's what we're doing. So mm. it's human behavior that causes pandemics, not the viruses themselves. Um, so, you know, but, but our behavior is leading us more and more to these, to these types of uh, accidents, you might say. And, and, you know, a classic example was, was HIV AIDS, which um, uh, it's killed 36 million people uh, since it first emerged from the rainforests um, in the late 1950s. And it quite possibly was started by a polio vaccine that was contaminated. And that has never been disproved. There's a lot of scientific evidence mm. for that. And so these are the kinds of theories we need to look at. For the same reason, we need to know how the coronavirus got out of the laboratory or the wet market or wherever it got out of. We have to know how these things start, else we won't be able to stop them. Hmm. Another one of those 10, eggs, 10 threats that you identified was self-delusion, which is particularly an interesting one. Yes, uh, it's quite a complicated story. I mean, humans have beliefs for a very good biological reason. If you're walking across the savannah, say a million years ago, and a tiger or a, you know, a lion jumps out at you, um, you don't sort of stand around and, you know, check everything out and form a, 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 an educated judgment about what's going on. You just get straight up a tree, don't you? What has happened in that instant is that your senses have detected a threat and your mind has painted in the rest of the picture for you. Whoops, it might be a lion. Oh, it turned out it was only some wild pigs or something else like that, you know. But you're, you're, what you've done is you've, you've painted a belief, and that belief saved your life, right? So, so that's what beliefs are actually for. But as society emerged and we got more complicated beings, we began to, you know, attribute the beliefs to God or to, you know, traditional stories and things like that. Now we have a situation where the beliefs are getting totally out of control. They're being manipulated by all sorts of people, by politicians, by religious people, by um, money marketeers, uh, you know, by uh, filmmakers, by all sorts of people. They're, they're playing on our capacity for beliefs to give us a false view of the world. And if we have a false view of the world, a false understanding, the threats are very much more likely to actually, uh, you know, to, to destroy us. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one thing to write a book, of course, Julian, and you've written a few, as you've mentioned, but it's another one to inspire a university, in fact, one of Australia's leading universities, the ANU down in the Australian National University in Canberra, uh, to form a commission, the Commission for the Human Future. And your book, Surviving the 21st Century, actually did lead to just that thing. Can you tell us a little bit about the Commission for the Human Future? Yeah, sure. Well, a lot of the credit goes to Professor Bob Douglas, uh, a, a retired epidemiologist from the ANU, who who read the book and, and thought that there was something in my arguments and that people ought to be aware of all the threats that we face and, and we ought to start coming up with some solutions. Um, and he held, he staged a large round table at the ANU of about 50 academics from all different disciplines. Uh, and the result of that was, yes, we should do something. And at that time, the former Liberal leader, John Hewson, was a professor. He still is a professor at the ANU. And he suggested that one of the things we could do was actually form a commission whose purpose was to inform people, give them the scientific advice about the nature of the threats we face, and to also to, to bring people together to try to come up with rational, sensible and lasting solutions to them. So that was what, the, what got the, the Commission for the Human Future off the ground. And uh, we've had one round table where we discussed the threats in general. Uh, we're about to discuss the food threat as our next topic, uh, and we'll just go on rolling all the way through the threats and the opportunities um, over the coming year or two. Hmm. Well, I know the report in, uh, I think it is March of 2020, just tabled uh, its first, well, I don't know whether it was the first report, but its report, uh, Surviving and Thriving in the 21st Century, and uh, we'll definitely have links to that downloadable report. It's about 38 pages. Brilliant, really. Um, and the show notes for this podcast. Um, the And as you say, it brings together an array of experts in a very holistic way 
of thinking that one of these, none of these, in fact, 10 existential threats, as they're called, they act in isolation, do they? No, they're all connected. And this is the point. You have to come up with solutions that cross-cut all of them. You mm. cannot solve one threat if you're going to make another threat worse. That does not make humanity any safer. So, for example, uh, if you try to solve the food crisis by pouring more fossil fuels and chemicals on the land, you're only going to make the climate crisis and the ecological crisis and the human poisoning crisis and all these other crises worse. So what we're doing at the moment to increase food production is actually making several other crises much worse. Uh, we have to, in other words, reinvent food. Uh, we have to go for renewable food. Uh, so it's not pillaging the earth to grow our food. So th those are examples of the kinds of changes that we're likely to recommend uh, to people. And we want to inform not only politicians and industry, but particularly, you know, the person in the street, the average citizen, what they can do in their lives to make this a safer earth for their grandchildren. Hmm. Well, I, I know you also, I think I heard you give a statistic which stuck in my mind that topsoil is being lost at the rate of did I get this right, 75 billion tonnes a year or something like that? Anyway, a huge amount. And that uh, I had the pleasure of talking to John Hewson in recent weeks and uh, he was mentioning that regenerative agriculture was an important part of the, many of these solutions. Yes, he's absolutely right. I mean, we cannot feed ourselves if we devour the earth by so doing. Uh, you know, that's just a, a dead end. Um, so if we destroy the soil space and the water base and the ecological base for agriculture, we are not going to be able to feed 10 billion people in the 2060s. That's, you know, and you add to that climate change, that's going to damage agriculture more than somewhat. Hmm. So the system we've got for producing food at the moment will not last. It, it's not sustainable. So it has to be replaced with something new. Um, I dealt with that in my book, Food or War, I described a system that is sustainable, how we can produce food sustainably, a circular system where we keep on renewing the food supply um, from the nutrients that, that we've got. We don't have to plunder the earth any longer or cut down any more rainforests to grow enough food for ourselves or produce enough food. So the, the point is that these things sound dire and grim, but there are solutions there and the solutions are all capable of making us wealthier, happier, more prosperous, of improving our well-being, improving our health, you know, um, improving our relationship with the natural world. Uh, so, you know, the, the solutions actually offer us a wonderful future if we can only get our head around them and, and get them implemented. Mm. Yes, I mean, it ticks so many boxes, you can only wonder why. You mentioned that uh, you, the other book that I wanted, and you've just touched on it as well, your more recent book in 2019, Food or War, and I was particularly struck by the fact that Professor Paul R. Ehrlich uh, wrote a, a, um, a piece on the front, you know, recommending the book as a must-read, and Paul Ehrlich, Professor Ehrlich, was a guest on our podcast also last year, um, tell us a little bit more about, about that, that book, the issues. You mentioned the circular economy. Ex can you expand on the, circular, the concept of the circular economy a bit more? Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, food or war, the hypothesis there is that when people don't have enough to eat or they haven't got enough land to produce it or enough water to produce it, they fight. And the evidence is we've been doing that for 20,000 years, okay? So, you know, what is a country, a nation? A nation is a, a line drawn around basically your farms and your fishing rights, your fishing grounds. Uh, it, it protects your food resources. Everybody is conscious of their food resources. And, you know, World War II began because Hitler wanted the Russian farmlands for German farmers, okay? That was the primary motive for his starting World War II. You can go into the his German history books and find that out. So this, this contest over food resources underlies two thirds of the human conflicts that we, that we have seen through history. So if we want to not fight in the 21st century and not risk a devastating nuclear war, then we need to get the food thing right first. But if we get the food thing right, if we produce a sustainable food system, 
uh, then we are going to be able to rewild half of, of the area now occupied by our farms and, and grazing lands. So we're going to be able to end the sixth extinction. We're going to have a much healthier diet than we've got at the moment. And basically, we're going to simply turn over our, our food supply. And, and let me just illustrate this with a, a city. There, there is no city on earth that can feed itself at the moment. They all import their food from, from miles away, where it's generally produced by a process of mining the topsoil and the water and, and the environment. And that's an unsustainable system. If, however, you captured all the nutrients that pass through that city on their way to the tip or on their way to the sewage farm or something like that, and you put them back into food production in one form or another, you know, growing algae, which you feed to fish, which you feed to consumers, that sort of thing. If you did that, most of our cities could, in fact, feed themselves. So part of the idea here is that we, we have cities semi-self-sufficient in climate-proof food. Uh, and, and that's not hard to achieve. You know, it may be expensive, but it's not hard to achieve. It's physically quite possible. And people are doing it all around the world now anyway. So um, that, that's going to be one of the big changes, that food production is going to come back into the cities to make cities more food secure than they are at the moment. In, in COVID, we've seen the food system nearly break down because it has to come from thousands of kilometres away in a series of ships and trucks and planes and what have you. That's a very vulnerable system when you have to uh, fight a pandemic uh, at, the, at the same time. So we need to produce more food locally and we need to do it by these modern methods of intensive food production in cities and also in the deep oceans. There's a huge scope for aquaculture, both of plants and fish, in the deep oceans, which we have not even scratched the surface of yet. So all of these processes are part of what's known as the circular economy, which is everything we throw away we don't actually waste. We just take it back into the production process again. It's the same as your aluminium can. 86% of the aluminium in the world today gets recycled into new tin cans or new aluminium products. So if we can repeat, replicate that for, for nutrients and for other metals and for building materials and for clothing, uh, textile fibres, then we have solved the problem of the throwaway society, of the endless growth society. You can have endless growth provided it's in a circle and not in a straight line. That's the point. Mm. Yeah, look, one last thing I wanted to ask you and taking, and I ask my guests this often, ta taking a step back from your role over many years as a science writer and clearly an observer on, of, of the world on many levels, because uh, we're all on this journey now together. We're, uh, I wondered if you might share with us what you thought was the biggest challenge that we as individuals face in our modern world on our journey through life? Well, I have concluded in all of these books that it is possible to solve the problems that we've got. Uh, it, it is technically quite feasible to fix all of these problems. You can ban nuclear weapons, you can ban fossil fuels, you can recycle your food, etc., etc. The solutions are obvious in most cases. But before you can do that, you've got to wake everybody up to the fact that we've got a problem. And, you know, nine-tenths of the world doesn't know we've got a problem. You know, they're just going their, their own blithe, happy, ignorant way. So the real, the real task is an educational one, an informational one. It's science communication, which is what I do. It's sharing the knowledge that scientists keep with the wide, you know, seven, nearly eight billion people um, on the planet today so that they can implement it in their, their daily lives and in the cons consumer decisions that they make. And I, I think that's the big challenge. We, we've got the technology to solve all our problems. We do not have the institutions, nor do we have the level of education that is necessary to solve them. So it is on the human side that we actually fall down. Mm. Well, Julian, you are playing your very significant part in this with your writings, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We'll have links to your books, your website, and, and that commission report, and uh, thank you again. Thanks very much indeed, Ron.
Well, I've had the pleasure of listening to Julian. That's why I, I invited him. I think I've mentioned to our listeners that I have the honour of being president of the Australasian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. We are currently, well, from May right through May and June, uh, putting on an eight-week conference called Environmental and Viral Disruptors, Rising to the Challenge, Reducing the Risk and Future-Proofing Humanity. And Julian has presented three presentations at that conference, each of those books that we touched on, the uh, Poison Planet, Surviving the 21st Century, and Food or War, all about food security. And, of course, his work, as I mentioned, um, uh, inspired the formation at ANU of the Commission for the Human Future. The chair of that was uh, Professor John Hewson, and he opened the ACNEM conference. So the ACNEM conference touches on so many issues that uh, Julian talked about in this, in, in this podcast. And, of course, he covers so many issues we cover in this podcast. And if you wanted to go back and listen to um, um, Alan Savory, for example, and that's why we reissued Alan Savory's um, uh, very inspiring uh, episode where he talked about holistic context, that before governments, before organisations, before individuals make any specific decision, they need to view it in a more holistic context. And, and uh, Julian was referring to the, human, the Commission for the Human Future, and he touched on 10 existential threats which his book and the Commission have focused on, and they are ecological collapse and extinction. We are going through the sixth great extinction, global warming, weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, of course, resource scarcity, global poisoning, food insecurity, pandemic disease, population, uncontrolled technology, and the last one, which um, is perhaps the most interesting, because unless we get this one right, none of, no, none of this is going to change, and that is self-delusion. So uh, we'll have links to all of Julian's resources. I would encourage you to read his book, to download the report from the Commission for the Human Future, and uh, leave us any comments on Facebook, and don't forget to go on to iTunes and leave us a good review, because the more reviews, the higher we go up in the ratings, and this message gets out there to more people. We've got some really exciting things planned in this really amazing year we find ourselves all in. Has there never been a more important time to focus on health, not just of yourself, not just of, of your family and community, but of our whole planet. As I often say, we are all connected, so we are all affected. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.